This episode is brought to you on Hawkstream, where you can find other podcasts like Music at the Dub, where Logan interviews musicians from all over the area. Harper to get it in, throws it to Ewing. Ewing surrounded, two seconds to shoot, he drives, he shoots, he missed! He missed! He missed! We win the bell, baby! Ding dong, the witch is dead! the ball at the 30, he's hit and got away, back up field to the 35, to the 40, he's in the 45, he's in the... Oh, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Hawk Talk with Easy and the Beards. I'm Easy. I'm beard number one. And I'm beard number two. There he is. He's a little bit in the distance. We got him on the other side of the room now. New semester, new setup. Yes. And I would comment, but we'll refrain. But um, yes, and as you know, we always have special guests. Very special guests today. Very, very special. We uh, have on the show today... Head coach Randy Hood of the baseball team. This will be his first season as coach. He's actually been around the program now for about 19 seasons, if I'm not 18. Mis- 18. Yep. This will be the 19th. So this will be number 19 for Coach Hood. His first as head coach. He's been an assistant here for, like you said, 18 years. So um, we're glad to have you on. Thanks for coming. No problem. I'm looking forward to it, and I'm excited about the season, excited about this podcast. Awesome. I think that you might be the first person that said that to us. <laughs> we appreciate it, though. <laughs> we're, we're, we're a quality three-star podcast. Yes. <laughs> Working our way up. We're glad to have the good review. Well, let's, so let's jump into it. One thing we like to do here is uh, kind of just touch on our guest background, just for a little mm-hmm. bit. I know, you know we kind of want to talk about the here and the now yep. more so. But uh, head coach Randy Hood, you were born in Goldsboro, North Carolina, yep. is that right? Yep, Goldsboro. Talk to us a little bit about maybe growing up, going to high school there in Goldsboro. Yeah, I went to Southern Wayne High School. Um, great, great baseball area. Uh, my junior year, we won the state 4A title. Um, after high school, went to Campbell University, played four years there. Um, had a, a good career as a player. Got a chance to play in the minor leagues for five and a half seasons. Uh, uh, had opportunity to be on two minor league championship teams. Um, a lot of people know I played on the 94 Barons team that Michael Jordan played on all season long. So it was a, a good experience and a learning experience and a lot of stories that I've been able to kind of just keep in my own personal book and occasionally tell a few here and there. Um, and then after that, you know, once I got released from pro ball, I uh, was at a crossroads whether I wanted to coach in college or, or stay in professional baseball. and. The opportunity came back up to go back to my alma mater at Campbell and coach. I actually spent six years there, kind of um, cutting my teeth as an assistant coach and learning the nuances of recruiting and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, during that time, got my master's while I was back there. And then um, the opportunity to, to come to Wilmington was, was, was right in front of me um, when one of their pitching coaches left to go to Old Dominion. And, uh, you know, I called Coach Scaff and I didn't. You know, I'm not a pitching guy. I'm more of an offensive type coach player. And uh, I said, look, if you can uh, figure out how we can uh, handle the pitch inside with somebody else, I'd love to come there and be an assistant and, and help, you know, continue building this program. And uh, a week or so later, he gave me the opportunity. And 18 years after that, you know, we've had a pretty good run. And, you know, I'm so um, excited to be part of this program. I still think we have a huge ceiling to get to. Um, There's great support here, and I'm just looking forward to just continuing what we've built over the last 18 years and also the people that were even prior to that that, um, you know, have been a part of UNCW baseball. I've always been curious a little bit. uh, You know, we played Campbell quite a bit uh, in in baseball and basketball, a lot of sports. They're right up the road. Obviously, it was right up the road for you there being in Goldsboro. Is that a place you wanted to go to? Did you have other options? Uh, talk about a little bit about well getting the camel in the first place. I'll tell my age because I'm I'm at the point back when I was in high school in the 80s. <laughs> um, recruiting is not like it is now, where you're recruiting and committing guys in eighth, ninth, tenth grade in a lot of sports. In our sport, you see ninth and tenth graders getting committed. I didn't commit until my senior year, June, after I had finished playing, which that was the standard a lot of times back in the 80s. Um, I was. Re- you know, talked to NC State, uh, Clemson, uh, schools like that, but never got anything seriously. I, I actually met Coach Cal Koontz, um, who was the head coach at Campbell, um, at a summer camp my junior year at Clemson's baseball camp. We c- maintained a great relationship. Um, he ended up offering me a scholarship 
that was what I felt was the best for me between a couple junior colleges and Mount Olive and a few other, you know, smaller D1s and just uh, went with it. I thought it was right and ended up being a great decision and um, never looked back from there. And then still on the on the uh, Campbell topic, uh, you know, nowadays they've got a pretty good thing going there. got a great program, yep. some great facilities. Yep. You know, talk about kind of what it was like, you know, back in the late 80s being at Campbell at a they were D1 school for Correct. baseball? Yep, 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 D1. And um, at that point, had never um, been to an NCAA regional. Um, there was Sunday play that they didn't allow um, in all their sports back at that point. So my senior year, we ended up winning the conference tournament. We actually won it in eight, my sophomore year. But for whatever reason, they didn't send the conference winner to the NCAAs. Um, but my senior year, we won it. and. Um, was placed in the Stanford Regional. Well, our school didn't allow Sunday play at the time, so they had to basically do the regional Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and if it went into Sundays, we would play on Monday. Um, we ended up, Stanford was the number one team in the country. We opened up with them, lost 7 nothing, but it was a close game until about the seventh, and then we played Southern Illinois in an elimination game, who were ranked 10th at the time, and we lost 8-7. to seven. So that was our quick trip, but first trip for a, a NCAA tournament team from um, Campbell, but ever since then that program's grown. The facilities have gotten a lot better over the last 10 years. They added football, which you know at that time was a non-scholarship sport, and they just went to scholarship <coughs> this past year. Mike Mentor used to play with the Panthers from Nebraska. Um, I have ties from Nebraska. My mom's from there, so I know Mike Mentor real well as far as just his career, and um, you know that. They've just grown a lot of things there, and it's the facilities are great. It's a great, it's a small school, but um, they've done a good job from an athletic standpoint. Pretty cool. You're part of the first regional there at Campbell, and yep. also here at UNCW. Yep. Uh, you, all these championships. Do you have all these old championship rings? I have. You, uh, I, I have a Brady? good collection. Um, I, I've told some people. I don't know if it's just. I don't think it's luck. I've just been fortunate enough being around good players, and I feel like I have a part of it as far as just uh, a winning attitude and, and knowing what it takes. Um, from a player and a coach standpoint, but uh, have a state high school championship ring uh, from college, two championships in a regional as a player. Um, summer ball, uh, the very first uh, year in the Coastal Plain League, won the championship there, um, and then two in the minor leagues. And then we've had what nine regular season titles here, set six tournament titles, and ten regionals in the 18 years I've been here. So it's it's been fun, um, but again, I say we got a higher <coughs> ceiling, and um, we're ready to kind of knock that next door down and get through a regional and get to that super regional round. And you're two wins away from World Series or Omaha if you get to that point. Rings get bigger if you get that far, right? The one we got this past year is the biggest we've had, and I mean, it's it's massive. It's They're nice. probably only going to get bigger than I would assume. Well, we're gonna we're gonna do our best to design them and, and let the guys enjoy them. Well, you mentioned the two minor league championships, one of which was with the Brewers. Yeah. Um, Double-A team, if I'm not mistaken. No. Um, Single-A? I was with the Brewers out of college for a year and a half, and it was um, basically I got sent to the Arizona League, which is a rookie league, and spent three or four weeks there and then got promoted to Helena in the Pioneer League. Well, since I was technically on that team for four weeks, they ended up winning it. So okay. I got a ring because I was on the team initially, but I was there for – part of the time so it's nice to be in you know yeah. added to it but I'll take it I'll take this that's, that's what right. I was gonna say I'd take it too I don't 24 hours there I'd take it and then and the second one was in 93 when I got called up to double a and spent the last part of the season there and we ended up going on and, and being the southern league champions cool now just a quick little <clears throat> backtrack on Campbell can you just talk about some of the influences that you've probably taken with you as a coach now from what you've learned from that stage going through up through the minors, some things that maybe you've brought with you now as a coach yourself? Yeah, I mean, the guy that co recruited me was Cal Kuntz. Um, if you go back, uh, he played on the 1969 Miracle Mets in the big leagues, was a pitcher for them. But um, he recruited me. He was there the first semester of my freshman year. But um, just a real stoic man, uh, didn't say a whole lot, really just kind of sat back and evaluated and watched people. And, you know, I learned a lot as I you look back that, you know, as a coach, you, before you make hasty decisions, you really got to pay attention to what's going on and sometimes evaluate guys because in baseball, um, especially from a recruiting standpoint, 
you know, guys mature real quickly over a year or two. So I can't make a hasty decision as a coach without giving them an opportunity to develop if, I, if I'm going to give them that chance. Um, so, you know, just little things from him. Mike Caldwell came in and was really my college coach. Um, again, big league pitcher for the Brewers. Uh, um, uh, pitched in the World Series. Uh, has two World Series wins, I think. Um, but uh, just a very straightforward, tell it like it is guy, laid back players coach. But uh, told you the truth, whether you liked it or not. And I've always, you know, that's been, you know, the big thing for me is, is you know, Sometimes it hurts or sometimes it hits people a little wrong way from a constructive criticism standpoint, but I think just being honest with people and letting them know where they stand is, is huge and doing that up front. But those two guys, and then obviously from a coaching standpoint, I've worked under Chip Smith at Campbell and Mark Scaff here and just, you know, taking uh, little things from each one of them and, you know, some, some of the things that are good and some things that are bad because I think as a coach, you got to believe in what you believe, but also, you know, I'm not, I'm not afraid to try new things or, or to go a different route if I think it's going to help us and make, and make a, a good impact on the players. Maybe just last, just uh, if we can get one MJ story from you maybe. I know that's something that, that's really popular when, when your name gets brought up and, and people mention it a lot. But outside of the work ethic, and, and probably for some of the younger generation that didn't really get to watch him play, mm -hmm. The work ethic was always there, the drive, you know, a competitive guy. But what are some things that maybe you saw that not everyone knew or saw about Michael Jordan? Well, first off, I don't think he ever slept. I think he maybe got two or three hours of sleep, and he just had a drive about him to, to, to compete and to win no matter what he did. I mean, whether we're playing cards on the back of the bus or he loved dominoes and all this kind of stuff, um, you know, he just – he was a – fierce competitor. Um, he would talk a lot of trash no matter what he did and what sport he was in because I think he knew if he got in your head a little bit, it would keep you from being your best. So, um, you know, I don't know if I've taken that trash talking from him, but, you know, there's times where I will pick guys' brains a lot just to see what they can take. Mm -hmm. um, not to be mean or anything, but just to kind of pry a little bit in there and see how mentally tough you are because I think when you all when it gets down to tight situations, it's the people that can handle the ups and downs, the mental things, the mental part of a game uh, that that end up being champions and win when it's all said and done. But um, you know, little things like that. Um, you know, I told this story a couple times already. The last couple times I've talked, but uh, you know, one of the first opportunities we had an off day, um, he 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 still he, he just came off of three NBA titles. So basketball was still in his blood. Like, he was the best basketball player in the world at the moment that he's playing baseball with us in Birmingham Bears, <laughs> like, even if taking a few months off. But he still wanted to play. You know, he said, let's go play some pickup. So first off day, um, he's at our apartment complex at, like, 10 a.m., um, pulled up in a Porsche, um, and we had a full-court basketball uh facility right there at the apartment complex that about seven or eight of us lived at. Um, he lived at a country club. Basically, he um, he got a family to just move out for six months, and, <laughs> and I'll pay you very nicely, and you can come back when the baseball season's over. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's kind of where he lived. But um, uh, he came over. Um, we picked teams, started playing, messing around, shooting around, having fun. Um, I was on his team that first time, and I uh, I grew up real fundamental in basketball. Played it, you know, up until high school. And you know, if I'd pass it, I'd go set a pick. I, you know, try to get somebody open. Well, the first time that I did that, and I went over and set a pick on his guy, he stopped the game and just said, "What are you doing?" And I go like, "I'm trying to set a pick, get you open." He goes, "I don't need picks in the NBA, and I don't need them out here. So quit doing that stuff and just keep your space and stay away from me." Good thing. Yeah. Yep. Won't, won't do that again. Never set a pick again. Just keep shooting. <laughs> but um, you know that was kind of cool, and you know we 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 did that multiple times, probably six or seven times that summer, where we would play pickup games, and you know, once people realized that he did that, you know, we'd have three, four hundred people out around the apartment complex just 
watching. My cell phones weren't huge then. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they were like carrying cases at times. But, uh, <laughs> they were literally huge. Yeah, yeah but um, you know, it was pretty neat to just all of a sudden have a a, a, a whole lot of people yeah. just hanging out, and you're just kind of playing pickup basketball. And he would let some of the locals that thought they could take him come yeah. in, and he would take three of us against four of them, and <laughs> we would just feed him the ball yeah. and let him go. Right. But um. After the very first, and this is, I'll finish with this story, um, but after that very first um, outing where we played, and I didn't really think too much about it, but, you know, his his mind of noticing things is pretty special. Like, I mean, he, he pays attention even though you don't think, and it's little things. But the next day I go into the locker room, and um, I walk in, and it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We have a 7 o'clock game. And I look over in my locker, and there's this big shoebox sitting in there, Nike shoebox. And I'm like, oh, cool. So I walk over and start opening it up, and it's a pair of um, Jordan 9 powder blue, powder blue Jordan 9 sitting there. And I kind of look over my shoulder, and he's just sitting back in his locker, and he's just shaking his head. And he goes, don't set any picks, and don't ever wear those new balances again when we play basketball. And I said, sure thing. <laughs> but um, at the time... I didn't think much of it. And I wore them a few times, and then I like later in the summer, I'm like, man, these things probably are something to keep and not really mess up because they're probably there's a story to them, but mm-hmm. they're also like at that time they're they're nice, oh, real yeah. nice shoes. So I have those, and uh, I did play them a few times. They got little scuffs, but uh, telling that story to some of our players that are real big into shoes, they're like, coach, bring them in, and I'll clean them up, and I got all this nice stuff that'll yeah. keep leather, and we'll we'll get them right. So. I need to do that and kind of really, you know, hopefully get him to sign them at some point. I never, yeah. honestly, I did not ask him to sign a thing until the last day of the season. That's how cool just being around him. A lot of us players didn't really kind of get into all that. We were just, it was just amazing seeing how it all works, how the season went. And, you know, you, you have the, again, the best basketball player in the world playing baseball with you. And, uh, sold out every game home and away um him taking his jet doing different things because he was still a business guy Mm -hmm. um just just a lot of weird stuff but neat um uh, just to experience all that but yeah got a lot of stories those are a couple but um you know it's pretty cool stuff you'll never forget you know what you you just sit down occasionally and just try to go back and 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 rehash a lot of that because you know as you get older you forget things and i don't want to forget a lot of things so I'll, I'll just at times where I'm just kind of by myself, just start trying to go back 10, 20 years and just start working my way back and trying to remember things. And now you don't remember or lose, lose thought of a lot of that. Oh, yeah. Those are stories I'd pull <laughs> all the time if I had to. I should probably write them down, but I right? literally have never wrote or, you know, done anything like that. And I think what was cool about that, I don't think anybody from that team has gone off and tried to make money off of that whole situation we just basically had a pack like you know this is what it is for whatever reason he's trying to play baseball um we're part we're part of it but we're not going to try to like abuse or go back and kind of you know make anything big of this it's his thing and we just were part of it yeah not trying to take advantage of it no no and to my knowledge i don't think anybody those teammates have ever done anything like that there's been some documentaries and things like that and you know, it's pretty cool to see your name, like, flash real quick in the lineup, yeah. bat and fifth, you yeah. know, and things like that. But um, other than that, you know, occasionally I'll have one of those players, you know, we'll text or, or, or email or, you know, just say how, how things are doing. You know, I have the ability, if I wanted to, to reach out to Mike and his guys that help him still. Mm-hmm. And occasionally constant contact, but nothing that we're, you know, we're just like, you know, bugging anybody for right? sure it's, it's just a, it was it was pretty neat is is really different at the time but you look back and it was pretty neat understanding him a little bit too i got a feeling he keeps an eye on guys like you too that he was connected with so i'm sure he's familiar with the uncw baseball team or if not he will be now that you're here as the head guy I'm, yeah i'm I mean, sure what was cool several years later when he got back in the game and he played with the bulls you know um, and then he went to the Wizards, you know, I, they had their training camp here. So, like, whenever they came on campus, I'd go up and kind of hang out at, at 
practice and shoot some free throws and then go up to D.C. and he left three tickets for me and a couple friends uh, for a, bu- a Wizards Bullets game. I don't even remember yeah. what they were at the time, but uh, so I saw him play in that kind of part of his career as well. But uh, you know, he just left his tickets, and you know, I didn't really go and hang out in the locker room. It was just you know, come up, watch us play, and drive back to Wilmington and start working again. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And then just to end it on this, do you think just based on his work ethic and what you saw? Do you think he could have made it to the majors if he switched full time to baseball? At that stage in his career, I think it would be tough. But if he would have maintained baseball more out of high school and earlier, definitely, I think talent wise, um, he he had the skill set. And uh, baseball is about instincts, no different than a lot of sports. And he lost a lot of that ability by not playing it at the age of high school. Um, and in college and things like that. But um, <clears throat> even just jumping in, and a lot of people go back and look, and he had his struggles. I, I played it all my life and had struggles at that level. Um, but, um, you know, he ended up, I think, hitting about 202. Uh, ended up hitting three home runs later in the season, which, you know, people went crazy, which they should. Of course. Um, but he stole like 40 bags and drove in like 50 some runs. And, you know, when we tested in early. Um, spring training, he was like the third fastest player in the whole organization. Wow. Which, you know, just little things like that, you know, you, you, you kind of believe he could have, but um, it would have been a tough road just from a baseball standpoint. But uh, I thought it was pretty, pretty, you know, amazing to just jump right in at that level and do what he did. And then, um, you know, um, you never know, but – I like him as a basketball player, and that's how I'll always remember him. You know, I was a big Bulls fan even before I met being around him because Southern Wayne, Laney, yeah. Hoggard, New Hanover were all used to be in the old Mid Eastern 4A. So when I was in junior high, he was packing out high school stadiums in Goldsboro and Wilmington, and like you couldn't get into the gym. And um, then he went to Carolina, and you kind of followed that. And then I remember in college, you know, watching WGN every night at 7.30 to watch the Bulls play and listen to the starting lineup, the way they called the lineup, and the mm-hmm. man in the middle, Bill Cartwright, yeah. and, and then Michael <laughs> Jordan. You know, that, that, that stuff was what I did. You know, I'd make sure practice was over, and I'd get all my homework because I'm watching the Bulls play on WGN whenever they had a game. And that was kind of me in college outside of baseball and things like that. And then all of a sudden, wham, I get in pro ball, and <clears throat> you hear that that yeah. guy's going to play baseball. And I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. That's pretty cool. That's great. Yeah, it's, 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 it's neat. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> those are all great stories, man. Yeah. You probably go on Thank forever. Thank you for sharing them. Yeah. But uh, let's, let's move on to the, the here and the now, I guess, and yes. uh, the interesting stuff. You know, this is kind of, I guess, we'll do a little bit of made shift uh, 2020 preview here of, of the UNCW baseball program. So just, you know, one more thing about you. So, you, you know, you take over the program now. It was announced kind of middle of the season last year. So, yeah. you know, everyone knew what was going to happen uh, going into the off season, uh, And, you know, pretty much everyone that's there to support you, your surrounding staff is basically the same as last year. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, we, um, you know, had to go through a process with my hiring. And then once I was named, uh, or announce the coach, um, then I had to go through the process of elevating or hiring someone in my full-time spot, which, um, you know, my initial intentions was to do what, what happened, but we had to go through a, a process with the state, and we did it, and, um, you know, the best candidate was the guy we had right here on campus, so was able to elevate Coach Chris Moore into a full-time position, and then at the time, our student assistant was Kelly Seacrease, who um, was finishing up his degree last year uh, and bumped him to the volunteer spot. And then, you know, obviously this past fall with Nick Fight coming back to school, he's our student assistant. He's finishing up his degree, and he's actually going to start his graduate degree this summer. So he's, he's working on taking the GRE and things like that. So hopefully we'll be able to keep him around a little bit more too. But, uh, you know, obviously with Matt Myers and Kelly Seacrest handling our pitching and myself and Chris Moore um, and Nick handling the offensive side, and then Josh Stott is our director of ops, and he's um, he's 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 the guy that kind of keeps us all going and keeps us organized. But yeah, great staff, guys that are very familiar with each other, and people that I'm very confident with. Yeah, I mean, usually when you see a head coaching change, there's a lot of 
shakeup and stuff like that. Not so much the case here. I, that's got to be a benefit to the program as a whole. Well, I think you look at you know loyalty and you think of um, continuity, and that's one thing that I've been able to with me and Coach Scaff for 18 years. Coach Scaff 27 here. You know we were always part of UNCW baseball, and yeah, we had pitching coaches and some other coaches go through, but the continuity right there and, and maintaining you know how the programs ran. Same thing with, with elevating these guys or just, you know, shifting around. We, we've got good continuity. And, you know, one good thing for me is that Matt Myers has been a Division One head coach in the past um, at two places. And Chris Moore has been a Division Two co head coach. So they've got head coaching experience. I can always, and I'm not afraid to ask questions and opinions and, and make sure we're all on the same page of what we're doing. So those are good guys to lean on to. And have Kelly and Nick come back that yep. played here. Former I mean, players that bleed it and uh, love the program. And, uh, you know, that's I, I think that's important. When we got guys that want to stay in the coaching profession or and I can help them out, I want to do that because, um, you know, that's how much, you know, being an alum, a part of our program, going to this school, I want them to, to be here and, and help us get to that next step because they all believe in it. Good stuff. And so, you know, on the same kind of topic of continuity, I think you said it in your introductory press conference, 61 starts, pitching starts, return from out of Six, 63. 60, 60 out of 63. 60 out of 63. Yeah, I think. Uh, I must have forgotten about that one. Uh, <laughs> I think the three were Blake Morgan, um, who, who pitched a lot for us in a lot of different <clears throat> roles. But, yeah, when you um, – you bring back Luke, Luke Giselle, Zarian Sharp, Landon Root, Blake Deathridge, Brody Lawson. I mean, that's the majority. And I think Gage Heron had a few starts in there too. But those 15. are 15 appearances, 11 right. starts. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, the, that's a one experience that we haven't had in a long time coming back. To, and hopefully, and they have all made improvements. So it gives you a lot of experience from a starting standpoint. And then we obviously got some older guys that are back to fill some bullpen roles. And then, you know, mixing the young guys from a pitching standpoint. And we're really excited about our pitching staff. And when it's all said and done, you know, it's pitching and defense that wins championships. And we feel very confident and strong with who we got. Now we've got to stay healthy and we've got to get out and do it. You know, on paper everything looks great, but you got to get out and compete and actually do it on the field. But um, we're excited. Can you just talk about what that means to, obviously, with, like you mentioned, Luke, Zarian, those guys coming back. What does that do for, obviously, you in your first year having guys that already know what's going on, that have been there, done it? What does that mean kind of for you and the program as a whole coming into your first season? Well, it helps me relax a little bit more and know that, you know, you don't have to uh, go out and, and, and start, you know, guessing who's going to do what. You, you Pretty much we have a good idea who's going to be starting for us um, early and who's going to um, fill certain roles. And obviously, you know, some things could shift a little bit over the next month or so, but I don't think drastically too much. But just from a, you know, first coaching opportunity and, and having to, you know, make every decision when it comes down to it, it gives you a lot of confidence and uh, self-assurance that these guys have been in a lot of situations over the last few years. They're back-to-back C8 champions. They've all been a part of it. And then, you know, just, uh, you know, let them go. Stay out of their way um, and, and, and just let them play because a lot of times at this point in their careers, they kind of know how their bodies feel. They've been through everything. We've just got to lead them and, and put them in the right situations to be successful. And, um, you know, Luke's a senior, Zarian's a redshirt junior who was drafted last year and turned down a decent amount of money from the Cardinals to come back, one, to get his degree, but also to get us to the next level. Um, one, because he believes in himself and felt that, you know, the value of where he's at in his career, he can improve it this year in college. Um, and then, you know, Landon has just, you know, steadily climbed from his freshman season to be in a position to be one of the best pitchers in the league. Um, and then, you know, a guy like Blake Deathridge is a guy that came here as a position guy. Um, we felt at some point in the, after a year or two that he'd be better suited to go to the mound. He's got an electric arm. You know, he just, he just hadn't had the right opportunity to just get and run with it. And um, I feel like he's at that moment now where we're going to give him that chance, and he's earned it, had a great fall on the mound for us, and uh, 
and he'll probably, you know, be one of those, he will be one of those four starters early, and, and then him and Brody will, will be in that fourth and fifth starter role um, as long as Brody stays healthy. A lot, lot of experience there, and it, it's, it's comforting. And then, you know, on the flip side of that, you bring in a handful of freshmen, you've got some JUCO transfers, you've got some guys that redshirted last year, mm -hmm. you've got some guys that maybe played a little bit last year. Can you talk about some of these guys that maybe we might see early on in the season? I, I know we'll probably see a lot of guys early on in the season, but maybe guys that are going to play some meaningful... Uh, From a pitching standpoint? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you got Braden Gorham, who's a fifth-year senior back. you got Henry Ryan, who's a senior you got Gage Heron, who started as a freshman and has had different roles, who I feel like has, has made a great improvement over the fall and will be a big impact. Nick Bruno. Um, Ryan Hare is a guy that, I mean, he's he's had a, 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 a tough row. Went to South Carolina. He was one of the top high school pitchers in the country. Uh, things didn't work out <coughs> in South Carolina. He went to a junior college. It didn't go great there. And basically, you know, he came in here uh, a year ago and we basically just have helped build that confidence back up. And he's he's light years ahead of where he was at a year and a half ago. And I think he's going to be a big contributor for us on the left side. And, um, you know, uh, you, you got young guys right now, you know, um, name-wise, you know, I don't know if any of them are exactly ready to just jump in and, and command a big role. But, you know, um, we have a good nucleus of young guys that I think are going to have an opportunity to, to be in the mix, and there'll be some that we might end up red shirting just because the experience that we have, and, and they're not ready right now. And then who do you see, you know, on the mound in the ninth inning in a, in a close game here uh, for UNCW to begin the season? Ah, uh, I mean, you know, it could be Gage Herring, it could be, you know, depending on the situation of Henry Ryan. I think we all have a ton of confidence in Adam Smith, who could also be playing shortstop a lot mm -hmm. for us. Uh, he's a two-way player that can be electric on the ground. He's going to end up going to the Cape this summer as a pitcher. So um, we'll see how all that plays out. Um, you know, uh, it's hard to say right now. I think we'll kind of have a committee that kind of finishes games. Hopefully the, the, the experience that we have from a starting standpoint will get us deep in games to where – our bullpen will be shortened and will be fresh as we play because I think, you know, I mentioned this, we've 13 out of our first 17 days we play games. So we've got 13 games in our first 17 days. So our pitching staff are going to have to go out and we're going to have to use more than just a few. You're going to have to, you're going to see the depth of our staff early. And I think that's good. You kind of get to find out who we are before we get kind of into the, the meat of the non-conference season on the weekends, but also into our conference season. And so, you know, on, on the other side of the battery there, as far as catching goes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you bring back two guys in Zach Bridges and Matt Suggs that kind of really end up splitting the catching duties last yep. year. I think, you know, Matt Suggs kind of ended up playing a little bit more as the season went on later in the season. And you bring in a couple freshmen there as well. How does that look to start the season? Well, I'm a lot more confident in our catching than we probably were as a staff going last year, just from an experience standpoint, because I think going into last year's season, we had one guy on the catching roster that had had three Division One innings. And, you know, catching's important. If you're pitching and defense is important, you got to have a guy that's back there that can handle the pitching staff. Breaking news. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Easy in the bench podcast. And, and honestly, you know, if you look at our history, we have had unbelievable catchers in the past. I mean – I've been fortunate enough, I think, between uh, uh, Chris Hatcher, Cody Stanley, Mark Carver, um, Ryan Jeffers recently, Jeffers. David Schaefer. I mean, we've got guys, three of those big leaguers, and uh, David Schaefer went from five different levels in minor league last year in his first full season. You know, resin all of them, I think. Yeah, and, I mean, our catching has been great. And so, you know, there's high – High expectations for that position, and I think over the fall, these guys have gotten better. Matt Suggs has made tremendous improvement. Local guy from Hoggard High School. Um, probably, if you combined catching ability, throwing ability, and hitting ability, he's probably all around, has the most skills there. Um, but I think he'll be, uh, you know, doing a lot of work back there. Zach Bridges is an experienced guy, a senior, uh, the oldest one, uh, you know, I think a lot of our guys have a lot of trust in him. 
And then the two freshmen. I mean, Kevin Patera, his brother played at NC State. Um, he, he's a baseball rat. He's a baller. The guys love him because he just comes out and works and grinds. And if we don't catch him, he goes play second base. And if he don't play second, we can play him third. He can just do a lot of things. He's not going to hit a ton of, with a power, but he's probably our toughest guy to get out from a two-strike standpoint. So I think he's going to find his way in the mix to, to, to be a contributor for us. And then Matt Yip, freshman from New York, um, came to one of our camps and was probably one of the best defensive catch-and-throw guys we had seen. Well, he gets to college, and he's had a little bit of shoulder problems, and he's ended up being one of our better hitters. <laughs> so what we thought originally, which I know he'll get back to, but he's – I think he's between the fall and early preseason has hit the most home runs on our team. On the coastal, right? Yeah, yeah, he's hit four or five since the fall, and, and he hit one, hit a laser off the center field um, batter's eye in our last scrimmage. But um, you know, he's got to he's got to mature a little bit more. But there's some some potential there, and uh, you know, between those four, I feel like we'll be able to figure out who's going to catch and who's and it might be more than just one guy. It's going to be a committee, like I said, and. I don't have a problem playing different guys and putting them in the right situation because, you know, you want them fresh, and uh, I think we've got guys that can, can get it done back there. Well, with a bat like that, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe you won't try to find a spot for him in well, the lineup occasionally. We, we tell all our guys that if you can't do things defensively, then the other position's DH, but there's only one of those positions, so mm -hmm. we can't have a bunch of – a bunch of DHs. DHs. <laughs> we got to be able to be able to play the field too. But sure. uh, he's proven that uh, he can do some damage with his bat. And you know, like I said, he just we just got to get him healthy shoulder wise because catching you throw a lot. You got to throw it back to the mound every pitch, and then you got to be able to throw it down to the bases. And you're the leader out there, so we got to get him, uh, you know, healthy there and confident to where we're we're confident that he can handle and do things. But you know, like I said, those other three guys have done a real good job, and you know. We'll be fine back there. Well, and you mentioned some of those guys too. Like you have a lot of flexibility with a lot of these players. They can play multiple positions. The season's long. Injuries happen. Yep. Guys get hurt. Guys move on. Whatever it is. But what does that mean to having that flexibility to where you know maybe it isn't Suggs catching every day or whoever catching every day. You have the flexibility to move them around and they can play multiple positions. Well, I mean. The easiest thing is to know you got nine starters and that's who you roll with, but that's not really how it all plays out a lot of times. And uh, we've got a lot of good players, we got depth, so have the versatility. At the, I mean, if you go back and look at catchers in the past, Ryan Jeffers played left field when he didn't catch. Chris Hatcher pitched and played the outfield when he didn't catch. Mark Carver played first base. Cody Stanley played the outfield because we've always had athletic guys that can play multiple positions. It's no different um, with some of our position guys. Jackson Meadows is very capable of being an infielder, uh, playing second, uh, or moving to the outfield. I mean, in our last scrimmage the other day, he went and made an unbelievable play in right field. The next inning, we had him at second base, and the first ball hit, it smoked up the middle. He makes a backhand play and flips it. Just two big-time plays. But him, Brooks Baldwin, I think you'll see as being kind of versatile guys for us that can play a lot of positions. Brooks played a lot at first base for us last year, but he's more of like a middle infielder and he'll play outfield as well. But those two will give us a, give us a lot of flexibility from a position player standpoint. Um, but yeah, just uh, having that ability because you're, you're correct, injuries, um, slumps, whatever, sickness, come in play over the course of the season. I mean, we in the two weeks we're dealing, I think we've had 13 guys out with some type of sickness the last two weeks. So we've been just, it's like a little infirmary back yeah. and forth, and hopefully we're getting it behind us. Um, um, so in two weeks we'll have everybody there. But, um, you know, we recruit athletes. Um, there's no <clears> guarantee <throat> that if you come in as a shortstop, that's where you're going to end up playing. Um, you, you probably might slide somewhere else. But... That's just how it's worked for us, and uh, you know we feel like we do a good job developing guys and, and, and putting them in the right place to be successful. That's great. So, to then look and stand kind of at the position players, mm -hmm. who are some guys that, you know, obviously like Cole comes to mind at third, maybe Noah in center. Yep. Who are some guys that are locks for their positions come opening day? 
Well, I mean, you feel like Cole Weiss being uh, Mr. Harrisonburg and uh, two-time uh, All-CA player and just been a solid player for us the last three years. Uh, as long as he's healthy, which, you know, um, you keep your fingers crossed all the time with players, but uh, he's going to probably be our third baseman. Um, he, he's done a great job. He's mature. Uh, he was drafted by the Giants last year, turned it down, decided to come back just like Zarian. So um, having him back as an experienced player, a guy that's been in the mix, is huge. Um, you know, and we're, we're Jackson's an all-conference player. He's back, whether he's going to play in the infield, the outfield, doing different things. Um, Kip Brandenburg is a guy that transferred into our program last year, had to sit out the spring. Um, but uh, he's probably one of the best first basemen that you will see. And I think he's going to hit, you know, in the middle of our lineup somewhere. And he is probably one of the best guys I've ever been around. And I, his teammates respect him so well. So I'm just believe he's just going to blossom into, you know, being a big part of our program. Um, Adam Smith played behind Greg Jones last year. And, uh, you know, you hope to see him, you know, keep working and, and doing things in the middle infield at shortstop. Um, Brooks Baldwin played every day pretty much as a freshman. We'll be in the mix either in the <coughs> infield or outfield. Noah Bridges played center field pretty much every day the last two years. You, you want to continue to see him develop. And then, you know, we have, you know, losing Kep Brown, um, you know, having an injury and, 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 and his knee injury that has basically lost him for the season. You, you lose an all-conference player that, that was a, a really presence in your lineup from a hitting standpoint as well. Mm -hmm. And probably, you know, mature-wise, you know, one of the most mature players I've ever been around too. So that hurts. I hate it. We're still dealing a little bit, just yeah. not knowing or, or trying to understand that he's not here, um, helping him get through all this. But uh, he's been, you know, good about it. He's going through his rehab and, you know, we're going to help him as much as we can just from, you know, the mental side of because, I mean, that's a that's a big hit to him, his family, us as a program. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, we, we feel like we've got a lot of good players to step in those areas. Um, uh, young guys, uh, Jack Kroon uh, from New Hanover High School is, is going to be a, is a baller, man. He's I mean, a winner. He's a winner. Uh, he, he, he works as hard as anybody. He's one of the first ones out there every day. It doesn't matter. He's working, and uh, he's going to find his way in the mix, and uh, and be in there for us. Um, you know, Trevor Marsh is a young outfielder that was the uh, National um, Legion Player of the Year last year. Um, he'll he'll be in the mix in the outfield. We got Noah Lyles back, who had the game winning hit in the CA Championship tenth inning last year. He's coming off back surgery in the fall, so his progression is is, is taking a little while. But, um, you know, a good mix of guys. Uh, transfer Tanner Wells, who um, came in from High Point, um, got a waiver to be el immediately eligible, will be a big boost for us from a power standpoint. And he just, he's a gamer and, you know, he's the, he's the team clown a little bit. You know, he, he jokes around, and, and, but he's, he's got a chance to do some damage with the, with the bat as well. But uh, freshman Ronald Evans, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's hard to pinpoint everything, but uh, he he would probably, if we started today, would be our DH just because I feel like he's going to be a big presence in the lineup and can do some things. But he'll probably play some first base. He played third base in high school. But right now, if we had to just say hitting-wise, he, he would probably slot into that DH spot if we started today. we got two more weeks, so we'll see how it plays. But um, I'm, I'm excited about the young guys. I'm excited about our older guys. And, you know, I feel like we got a good mix. Yeah, you mentioned Cap. That's just unfortunate. I know he's dealt with injuries most of his baseball career, and it kind of sucks to see that happen. Now, is – because I, I remember reading his Instagram posts, and it, it almost felt like, like a retirement post, right, the way I, I read it and a lot of people read it. Do you know if, if that – his final decision or if he has not made a final decision yet about going forward if that's something you know obviously he's going to rehab be here do that get through it be part of the team this year I'm sure his voice and just being present is going to be a big part of the season for you guys do you know if that's it for him I won't speak for <clears throat> him but 
our conversations and everything that we've talked about and everything that I think where he's at in his life right now, I think he, he feels like he's done playing baseball. Um, he's gone through a tremendous amount. I mean, one of the top high school players in the country mm-hmm. was expected to be a first-round draft pick out of high school towards his Achilles his senior year. Um, ended up going to Miami on a scholarship. Things didn't work right there at the beginning. He transferred to a junior college, basically played hurt for about a year and a half. Um, still did well. Um, you know, great opportunity for us to bring him in and just, you know, hopefully, one, get his confidence back and get him healthy, which over the last two years he has. And he's he would tell you it's probably the best two years of his life from a baseball standpoint. Big part of things. And then this happens the last day of exams in the fall. Um, it's a nine-month recovery. He's a smart, intelligent guy that's going to be successful in whatever he chooses to do. Um, he, he's thought about grad school. He's thought about law school. I think just the process of going through nine months, a sixth year sports-wise or getting on with his life, I think you know he's just decided that you know I think that's his route that he wants to take. I'm not going to say finalize because that's totally up to him. But um, I think that's where he's at right now mentally and uh, thinking that, you know, he's done for, with college sports baseball-wise. He might come back and play golf, a great golfer. He asked me, he said, do you think I could make the golf team as a six-year guy? <laughs> and I said, well, if you get healthy, you could probably compete. Now, I know they're very good, but he's really good, too, in yeah. golf. And he can hit it a long ways with that big body. I and bet. He's actually got great feel and touch. So, um, you know, I, I don't know – if, if it's definitely all said and done, but, you know, I think that's where he's leaning to, and um, we're just going to be here. And, you know, once he gets to where he can walk around and do some things, he's going to be a big part of just being there and being the experience and helping us. And then, um, you know, we've just got to keep putting our arms around him and help him get through this because, you know, it's a tough decision and a tough time for him right now. And, you know, we're just going to be there and be part of the family and, and, and love on him and make sure he's okay. Yeah, and support him regardless yeah. of the decision That's right. he makes. That's right. For sure. Well, let's uh, you start winding things down here, I guess, in the last few questions and the last few topics here. Something I love talking about is always the schedule. Yeah. Um, so looking at the schedule this year, nothing crazy different from years past. you got your... Uh, you know, opening tournaments at home, the Seahawk Classic, the Hughes Brothers Tournament, yep. where you bring in a lot of teams. A lot of teams come down from the north because their fields are covered in snow or yep. ice or whatever they got up there. Uh, but you get this, you, you know, you play a lot of teams in a short period of time, yep. kind of like you were referencing. And, uh, you know, so I think that's good for everybody. Uh, you got your standard kind of midweeks against some really, you know, yeah. top notch opponents that's just. By virtue of being here in North Carolina, you've got a yearly thing too. You know your UNCs, your ECUs, uh, NC States, Coastals. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are always ranked teams. Usually, you know, pretty heavily attended (coughs) matchups. It's always a good atmosphere. Those kinds of things. Uh, You've got a a trip this year, which I know was not originally part of the plan, but now it is to Kentucky. Yep. Uh, So that's SEC program. I know they've been in regionals here over the past decade and whatnot. So. uh, Quality program there. You've got Liberty program that was just in the last regional uh, coming here. Yep. Uh, for a real good program. Uh, yeah. So two regional opponents. Uh, actually, well, they didn't face each other in the regional, but they were in the same regional, uh, facing off here in a weekend series at Brooksfield. Uh, you know, talk a little bit about that schedule and kind of what it was like. Uh, you know, making any tweaks you had to make. And yeah, I mean, scheduling is usually done two, sometimes three years in advance. From a non-conference standpoint, obviously conference is set and you get it hopefully a year or two in advance so you can kind of start plugging in your midweeks around that based on where you're going in the conference and, you know, whether you want to play on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, things like that. But, um, you know, like you said, when I got a hold of the schedule and, and I have kind of used to do the schedule, then Coach Scaff took it over and then, you know, we would talk and... You know, if he had some questions about, you know, who do we want to play, you know, we would always input. But um, when I got it and kind of got hold of it this this summer, you know, I realized we're playing the first seven weeks at home. And I was like, Coach, um, I, I want us to go on a road one time, you know, just so the first conference series isn't our first road trip. So 
made a few calls, knew Kentucky was open, uh, had to drop Gardner Webb, which, you know, I didn't like having to make that call because they had just hired a new coach, and I'm telling him, like, need to get out of it, but I'll help you do whatever I can. We'll set up something down the road. And he was great, and it worked out uh, for both of us. But, um, you know, going to Kentucky in the third week will be a great trip. Uh, hopefully the weather will be all right. But, you know, they just opened up a $40, $45 million um, Taj Mahal Stadium uh, on campus right there that's going to be neat to, uh, to, to play in. But also, you know, they're a good program, and it'll, it'll again, test us. And I think it's important to kind of get away from what we're used to and play at different places and play in facilities that hopefully will be – you know, the same type areas we are in postseason after CA and getting into the regionals and things like that, you, you, you kind of want to get let your guys fill it before you actually get there sometimes. Um, and uh, so, yeah, opening up the first two weekends at home, a very good Bryant team who I think picked preseason number one in their league. Um, very similar to like a Northeastern, uh, very good baseball uh, from the Northeast. And then Dayton, I think, uh, picked third in the Atlantic 10. Uh, very good program and got some some high-end pitchers on their team that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of buzz in some of the preseason stuff. So very competitive first week. Hopefully, you know, we'll be ready for those guys um, midweek with State. Um, and then, you know, our, our Hughes brothers, uh, we have Butler, Marshall, and, um, and help me. Um, Bowling Green. Bowling Green, yeah. Don't know a lot about Bowling Green. We played Butler in the past, um, and then Marshall. We were here last year, and I think uh, we lost a one nothing game to them. And so, you know, hopefully we'll pay them back a little bit. And um, and then, like you said, the midweeks, uh, there's no breaks. And that's why a Blake Deathridge or a Brody Lawson or anybody that we feel like we've got to be competitive in the midweeks because for us, a top program like ours, I want to build our resume from an NCA standpoint from day one. And you've got to win weekend series no matter who you're playing. You've got to win midweek games because they're quality wins and quality teams that you're playing. And you got to put yourself in a position RPI-wise where you're in that top 50 going into the back of the season to where, you know what, maybe we don't make the run like we did last year at the back end, but we're in position because our season dictated that we played well enough to deserve an at-large position. So that's where I want our guys. And we've always talked about that and preached it, but you, you've got to be ready every day. And you've got to get wins, and you've got to beat quality teams, and you've got to win at home. You can't lose at home. Like I've, It's been one of our daily things that we have to, we have to be better at Brooks Field than what we were last year. And typically we are, but last year was different. We were 17 and 16 at home, and um, there's no excuse for us to play like that at home. You know, this is our home. We should come out and dominate here and play well. And, you know, the fans get into it and, and get behind you. And you, you just – you got to love playing at home more than we did last year um, from, from how we played and, and the wins losses. But uh, building our resume is important. And, uh, and then, like you said, the non-conference games with – Memphis, East Tennessee State, and then Liberty, they're all going to be weekend battles that, you know, nothing's going to be easy. Um, uh, the Carolina on the back end, a couple games with NC State, three games this year with East Carolina, uh, two with Campbell, who has really improved their program and, and have been solid, uh, and then a two with North Carolina Central. But uh, the third game with uh, East Carolina this year will be at Granger Stadium in the Pro Park there at Kinston. Uh, last time we played there was in the 2004 regional that East Carolina hosts where we um, beat Tennessee two times. Um, so that will be pretty neat going back there playing. We actually got two, three of the old seats from the old Granger Stadium taken out, refurbished them in teal, and they're up in our office right now. From So it's just a little history there that, you know, a lot of the current players don't know, but guys that have been around kind of remember that. I remember Jonathan Batts hitting a 3-0 Grand Slam home run, gave him the green light as a freshman, and he just cranked one out over the scoreboard against Tennessee, and the place was rocking, and uh, it was pretty cool. It's a pretty cool stadium, you know, just yeah. the history behind it. And, yeah. I, and I love the idea of having that. It's it's a neutral site game. Yeah, it's going to be it's 30 tech, minutes from close Greenville. To Greenville. Yeah, technically. We tried to go to Fayetteville Beach, and yeah. um, Zebulon, but 
their pro seasons didn't allow that game to get played. So, you know, I don't care. Um, we'll, we'll get our people there, and there'll be a lot of um, purple there. And, it, again, it gives you that regional-type yeah, feel. Absolutely. Later in the year, if, if we – don't play well enough to be a host, and we are into a postseason and playing at LSU or South Carolina, we've been in that environment before, and it's not the first time. So that's kind of what you look at when you do those type things. Well, that stadium in Zebulon is in the middle of nowhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is. Yeah, it's like, like Field of Dreams. Yes, almost. exactly. Yeah. Very much so. That weird upper deck thing. Too. Yeah, it, it is weird. But another it's Brewer a, shout out, by the way. It's sure, a, yeah. And that's, that's their I, uh, when I double was A with team. Birmingham, they were double A team for the Pirates and faced Tim Wakefield, who was the knuckleball mm-hmm. pitcher in the big leagues, had its struggles, came back and pitched in double A and um, faced him. Um, that's when he became the knuckleball pitcher, right? Because yeah, yes. originally he wasn't out. Yeah, and yeah. that's, he went back to the minors, Worked became on, the guy yep. that he, and, we all know. And then in 94, when we went back to Zebulon. You know, obviously Michael Jordan being <clears throat> from North Carolina, like you couldn't get a ticket oh, for bet. that 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 series. And uh, <laughs> the, this is the, another funny thing, but like um, he took an off day, you know, where he didn't play in one of those games. Which when they announced all the games, Ooh. they never told anybody when his off yeah. was because they want to sell yeah, tickets. Of course. So who's playing right field the day that he's not playing? You. Me. <laughs> they announce my name. And I run out to the outfield, oh, wow. and I get booed, oh, <laughs> like wow. by five, six, seven thousand people. people. Oh, yeah. And like I literally grew up an down hour the and road, a half down yeah. the road. But and you're probably you know, thinking, damn, like of all the days, of all the play days yeah. that I'm playing right field, um, yeah. But yeah. again, different things that that was pretty cool about it. Even though I got booed in Zebulon, North Carolina. What's just quick <laughs> quick question here, kind of. Just a little sidetracked, but you know, there's been a lot of talk recently about kind of the minor league system mm-hmm. as a whole, and mm-hmm. you know, I guess some of the bigger, some of the clubs want to contract, you know, minor league teams. Do you have any kind of thoughts on what um, you've been hearing about that? I kind think of stuff? what they're trying to do is um, improve the quality of life and and the quality of the workplace for minor league players. Um, it's it's not an easy road. Uh, when you sign a minor league contract, if you're not one of those guys signing a big bonus, you're basically getting paid $850 to $1,500 a month to play baseball. And back when I played, you still had to pay rent. You didn't mm-hmm. have host families. <clears throat> they didn't have spreads for food after games. Like, if you didn't have parents to back you and do things, it was hard, oh, yeah. hard life. You're living five, six people in – um, houses or whatever. Living um, on a bus. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You're. I lived in a hotel at Helena, Montana, the whole summer. Um, there was four of us in the hotel. It was like an open t- studio room and just beds in every corner. <laughs> and then, and that's how we made it, you know. And you're, you're just hoping to like keep working up the ladder to where you get to the big leagues, and that's where the money's at. So, I think over the last thirty years. They're basically saying, you know, we need to improve that a little bit. They're probably getting pressure from, um, you know, a lot of different watch groups and things like that. I, I don't know how it all is actually played out. But um, it looks like they want to contract to about 120 minor league teams. So that would take 40 minor league facilities, towns, out of the mix, which based on everything I'm hearing is all the short seasons, like the Pioneer League, the Appy League. Um, the New York Penn League. I think they're looking at stadiums that are small, you know, more right. small, mm-hmm. small towns. And, and don't have the amenities and the facilities to where these organizations send their players to feel comfortable in their development. So um, there's going to be upgrades at a lot of places. You'll see new ballparks um, kind of come in play. I think you'll see the leagues kind of like the Carolina League's a 10-team 10, 10 league. I think they'll probably expand to 12 or 14 mm-hmm. um, when it's all said and done. You'll see the draft go from 40 rounds to probably 25. So what it and will happen, I think you'll see a lot more college players yeah. staying in college and not signing as juniors. And you'll see fewer high school guys, just the elite guys signing um, because there's nowhere to play. Like there's so many international players being signed right now that, you know, 
they are developing them in those academies in, in Dominican mm-hmm. and Puerto Rico and all the international areas, and they're signing them. As soon as they get 16, they're in their academies, yeah. play for a year or two down there to develop, and then they're pushing them here to their spring training complexes yeah. so you have an abundance of international players that are coming, and that's all they do. Yeah. That's all they do is play baseball. So, um, yeah, just the numbers game is can kind of contract into where you won't see as many minor league teams in each organization. So I think you'll see the college is more of that development area. Like you're seeing when they put stats out, a lot of the, the players are four-year college players now in the big leagues or your international players. And, you know, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see. But I think in the next three years you'll see a lot happen. And, um, you know, Hopefully for the best when it's all said and done, because as a baseball fan, you want you want at all levels to be good, be good, and um, you know I still try to follow pro baseball as much as possible, and uh, and we'll see how it all plays out. But I think it'll be good for college baseball as well. For sure. And then, kind of just in closing, then um, your expectations for the team this year. Obviously, back to back CAA titles, back to back NCAA tournaments. I know you've talked a lot about knocking the door down to get to that next level because I think that's really all that's left for you guys is a trip to Omaha. I think you've kind of accomplished everything leading up to that that area. And then also, separate from that, now I've heard you mention prior to Kep getting hurt, Kep was the one guy that you were most looking forward to bouncing back this season and having a big season. Now that you know, obviously, you'll be without him, who is that guy that you expect to have a breakout season, whether it's a freshman, sophomore, or somebody that's just returning that you know has been putting in work and can take that next step? Well, I'll answer that question first, and then we'll go to the, the other one since that was the last one you asked me. But, uh, you know, I, I think player-wise, <clears throat> um, if you just look at guys that, and I'm not going to name one, I'll name three or four, and it's not putting pressure on them, but I think Matt Suggs will have a big year for us. I think uh, a Jack Kroom will get into the mix and be a, a big contributor for us. I'm, I'm hoping Noah Bridges takes that next step and becomes the elite player that a lot of scouts see that has tools um, just to understand who he is and use his speed and just, and just you know play like that, play crazy and wild and steal bases and score runs and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, um, I expect Cole Weiss to continue to just be solid and, and be the, the dude that everybody on our team believes in. Um, on the mound, you know, you got guys that have, have done it. Um, I'll just go like, I think it's Blake Dethridge's year to be a big part for us. Um, I think you'll see Gage Heron step back up and be the type pitcher that he was as a freshman. Um, and, um, Whatever role Adam Smith plays, whether it's as an sh- everyday shortstop or a closer, I think he's going to be a big part and and be in some in some mix of importance for us in games um, as a two way guy. Um, it, it'll it'll be fun. I mean, uh, I I think all our guys I have a lot of expectations for, and I I know I left some guys off that I probably should mention, but it's no, nothing against them. I just you know I, I'm excited with what we got. I think our guys are excited to get after it. Um, You know, just, uh, yeah, I mean, our goal is every year is to win the league, to get into a regional and and make an Omaha run. Um, Anything less of that, it's not a failure, but we're disappointed because um, it's fun to win and it's fun to dogpile at the end of the season, whether it's conference championships. uh, When we do win that first (coughs) regional, that's going to be pretty special. Um, and it's going to happen soon. Um, and it can be done at our level. It can be done. Uh, Coastal proved it four years ago. Yep. Fresno State proved it ten years ago. Um, it's, just, um, it's just a matter of things falling in the right place, being consistent throughout the year, and uh, believing that the work you put in daily, there's a reason for it. And um, I'm excited about our guys. Um, you know, where we stand in the league – um, I've actually got to turn in the all-conference ballot today in the, the, the league standings preseason, pre-season stuff yeah. um, the day at f- by 5, and then I think it's posted next Wednesday. Do you want me to help you with that? Uh, I might ask your questions, yes. I don't mind, I don't mind helping. Yeah, you can come over to the office. But, uh, 
you know, I, I would think based on who we got coming back, uh, we would probably be in that one, two, or three yeah. preseason area. Um, whether depending on where we're at, it really don't matter. It's nice. It's great. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Northeastern has a lot back. I think William and Mary's going to be strong. James Madison's a wild card. I mean, our league's good. Um, there's some good teams, and I think there's enough quality teams that potential to have multi-bid team uh, for the postseason again if everything goes right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exciting <clears throat> for our league. But um, we'll be ready to go, and, uh, and hopefully we'll get off to a good start, and it just builds and keeps rolling because uh, I think this team's eager to uh, – to see where this journey is going to take them, uh, and and continue to, you know, do what UNCW baseball usually does, and that's be very competitive and 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 be in the mix at the back end of the season when it's all said and done. For sure, and I think it helps for a program like here when you have guys that turn down the opportunity to go pro, that say, you know, I I want to come back, I want to be part of something bigger, yep. because regardless of your background or how much your family makes. To turn down the opportunity to start your dream, you know, obviously it's in the minors, you start in fall league, whatever, and you go up, but to have the confidence in yourself and in the program you're at to come back and do that, I think that's that's huge for a school yeah, like it's, this. It's been a long process to build that, what I call um, just history and also where people believe in what really is going on and how we're doing things. Um, you know, I, I look back three years ago when we um, were able to get Greg Jones to come to school here. He turned down over a million dollars mm -hmm. out of high school yeah. to sign. And you don't see that no. hardly ever. Not at but all. But he believed in what we were doing. Him and his family knew that he knew it needed a couple years to develop. And it turned out pretty good for him. I mean, basically tripled what. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the 22nd pick over on the draft, $3.2 million at and he's going to be in the big leagues. Um, but then a guy like Azarian Sharp, who turned down six figures, um, to say, you know what? One, I value the education because I told my mom I wanted to graduate, and I'm going to do it. Um, but also to trust coming back um, and, and helping us take that next step. Cole Weiss, who, you know, he's not the most flashiest guy, but he's solid. He's a good baseball player, so... In the back of his mind, well, will I ever get this chance again to be a professional? Yeah. There's no guarantee, but again, great family, dad's a principal. Yeah. School's important. Hey, I love my teammates. I love our program. I want to keep, I want to be the first team that goes back to back to back and get that next step. And I think that was huge. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, you know, and we're never trying to just basically tell the guys, like, don't do this. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're educating them to what we believe in and what is the pros and cons of every decision. And then ultimately it's up to them and their parents. But, uh, you know, I think that speaks a lot about our program right now to have those two type guys to come back. Uh, and, and I think you'll continue to see that in the right situations. And um, it's exciting. I want the best for them because, you know, they're basically, you know, it's not a gamble, but, you know, they're basically just saying, hey, I believe in what we're doing, and um, I'll roll the dice, and I, I know we're gonna, we're gonna, it's gonna be all right at the back end of things. Absolutely, and you've you've played a big part in building a foundation here that will sustain for quite some time, I think. So, congratulations well, to you. Hopefully, in a new role, I don't mess things up. I yeah. just kind of let the guys go, but uh, um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but, but yeah, uh, just uh, you know, stay out of the way and uh, and do what do what I've always done. I think that's huge. That you know. I'm not changing who I am just because the titles change. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna still be who I am, and uh, a stickler on doing the little things, and you know, and I, and I get on them like little things about cleaning your shoes, and all that kind of stuff. They yeah. hear it every day because I believe in just that process of taking care of things, doing things the right way will lead to bigger things for us as you as an individual, but us as a team. And um, I think our guys have you know, bought into that, and it's been a big part of our program, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, well, we look forward to seeing you this season, so good luck. Appreciate it. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you again.
This has been another episode of Hawk Talk with Easy and the Beers. We appreciate it. Thank you, Coach Hood. We'll talk to you later. All right, guys. Thank you all. Absolutely. Yeah. This episode was brought to you by Beard Number One, Michael Barnes, on Twitter at BS Zeus BS. Me, Beard Number Two, Avery Ferry, at Avery Ferry on Twitter. And then also Elijah Mize, known as Easy, at Sports Guy Eli on Twitter. And let's not forget the new guy bringing you our video for this podcast, Jordan Robinson. You can follow him on Twitter at jpicante.